in Forsyth County. Thank you. And we're excited to have you here for a discussion tonight of the book Surviving Hitler, Evading Stalin. I am a co-regional director with the North Carolina Council on the Holocaust for District 5. And some of the other people who work with us on the council are here tonight. They'll be introducing themselves. I would like to ask you if you are in a place where you can turn on your camera and you're comfortable doing so, if you would. Um, we understand if it's not feasible, but we all remember those days of teaching to black boxes. And it's just a little more <laughs> engaging when we can actually see an audience out there. So. Tonight, we're going to be, so let me share my screen, we're going to be discussing the book Surviving Hitler, Evading Stalin, all right, which is the story of our survivor just before her 16th birthday, birthday Mildred Schindler and her family are captured by Russian soldiers. So she's going to talk about how they survived. Hitler, and then they had to face Stalin. The agenda for tonight, we're going to start with introductions of all the people who are involved in the webinar. We'll have a documentary of Mildred's story. Then we'll go, then go to a presentation by Susan Nickerson, who is Mildred's daughter, and then a presentation by the author, Sherry Green. Mildred will then share parts of her story, and then we'll have Q&A with her, uh, hopefully a few minutes to be able to ask some questions. And then finally, we'll wrap up, hoping to get out of here right on time at 8 o'clock. So I'm going to turn this over now to some of my fellow council friends here, starting with Amy Todd. Hey, everybody. I'm Amy Todd. Um, I am one of the uh, other co directors for Region 5. Um, I work in Randolph County at Trinity Middle School and I teach seventh grade language arts. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Laurie Schaefer and I teach in Winston-Salem for South County and, I'm in the, I'm, and I am the director for Region 5 um, and very excited to be here tonight with you. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to uh, share with you the introductions here um, before we get going into our documentary, All right? So uh, the first thing that I want to uh, emphasize, uh, of course, is this the story of uh, Mildred Schindler, and she's going to be talking to us at the end. Um, but our um, two presenters before that, who will be presenting together, um, and um, that is uh, Sherry Green, who's the author of the memoir, um, and Susan Jansen Nickerson, who is Mildred's daughter. So you're going to see um, both of those here from these ladies about the journey to uh, in making the memoir, publishing it, um, and also the documentary that you're about to see, um, which we're pretty excited about. Um, and they'll also talk to you about new editions of the book coming out, some education editions, um, very soon, I believe, and I'm going to let them tell you about that. Um, but uh, we also are going to be hearing um, from Mildred herself, and then this is the cover of the book, um, that you can get in lots of different formats, including audiobook format, and we'll be sharing those resources with you too. Um, so you're going to be uh, learning about the geographic setting of where the story happened and how it is a unique perspective of what happened during this time period. Um, so I'm going to kind of just give you the uh, use terms for the documentary because you will be able to use this documentary in your classroom if you would like, but it's especially for us right now because it has not actually even been fully released um, and will be entered into some um, competitions and things like that. But the producer has allowed us to be able to share with you um, this really good documentary. It's short, so it's easy to use in the classroom. Um, and I think is one that you will find uh, really extraordinary. So this way you'll at least know what the book is about um, uh, before you purchase it and read it. Or some of you may have already uh, even uh, gotten the book. So um, just to let you know, at the end of the webinar, we're going to be sending 
um, the all the links to everything that we talk about. So rather than pummeling you with lots and lots of little um, things in the chat, we're just going to send it all to you in a follow up email after the webinar. And that way you can always go back through your email um, and search for it and find the links that you need um, when and if you decide to use this in your classroom. All right. So I'm going to stop there and I'll let um, Susan and Sherry finish this presentation later. But for right now, I am going to come out. I need to have a couple different screens going on. So I'm going to come over here to the video. Okay. I'm going to get a little larger here. Um, and we're going to go ahead and um, watch the video so you'll know the story itself. Keep, in, keep thinking in mind since um, you guys are all teachers too, uh, how you could use this in your classroom. Um, and I'm going to, without further ado, go ahead and play the documentary. Story. Um, we're going to switch now to hear from, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to hear from uh, Miss uh, Sherry Green and Susan Nickerson. They're going to kind of walk you through a little bit more of the details. I'm going to um, share uh, their presentation with you. All right, and ladies, I'm going to bring this up and go ahead and present and invite you to dive in and tell us more. Well, thank you, Lori. Um, Susan Nickerson, I'm uh, Mildred's daughter and uh, want to tell you that there are several unique aspects of the survivor story of my mother, Mildred Schindler Jansen. Mildred was born on March 11th, 1929 in Great Bend, Kansas. Her father, Fritz, had come to the United States in 1922. Her mother, Anna, had arrived in 1926. Mildred is a Gentile. Most World War II memoirs are written by Jewish authors. Her family story contradicts a commonly held misconception that all German citizens living during the years of the Third Reich were Nazi sympathizers. Her survivor story begins on February 1st, 1945 and continues during the next two years after the war. Mildred's story is a remarkable account of God's faithfulness, which will encourage and inspire readers trying to make sense of equally be bewildering circumstances. Mildred's story is quite unusual in that neither she nor her mother were sexually assaulted by Russian soldiers. Approximately 2 million German women were assaulted by Soviet occupiers during the spring of 1945. Over 100 original photographs and documents related to Mildred's family are available, including those that survived the war. Most are in her memoir. According to a Holocaust educator, Mildred's story is the only one by a World War II survivor who was affected by the Nazis, the Russian Red Army, and the Polish Army. Unbeknownst to Mildred, an executive order known as the Truman Directive was issued December 22nd, 1945 by President Truman. It ordered refugees and displaced persons in Europe with American ties to be brought to the USA. It also sets immigration quotas for displaced persons. The total brought to the United States was 22,950. 15,300 were Jews and 7,650 were Gentiles. And Mildred was one of those Gentiles. From February to May of 1946, Mildred lived in Berlin with her father's sister, Tante Mariechen Schindler-Bohm, and her family. Spring of 1946, her cousin Baltrout tried to help Mildred get a job at the American consulate, where she worked. It is there 
that she learned the significance of her birth certificate. From May to December 1946, Mildred went to live in the displaced persons camp, most likely Mariendorf camp, in the American zone of Berlin. December 19, 1946, four ships were assigned to bring displaced persons to the United States per the Truman Directive. December 26, 1946, Mildred and others moved from Bremen, a port city. Mildred was assigned to the SS Marine Marlin and on January 10, 1947, Mildred left Germany aboard this ship. And on January 24th, 1947, Mildred arrived in the USA through Ellis Island, New York, New York. Late January 1947, Mildred arrives by train in Great Bend, Kansas, and met her uncle, Charlie Herb, and Tanta Anna, her father's sister, and cousin Margaret. She lives with them until May. May 1947, Mildred got a job in a diet kitchen of St. Rose Hospital in Great Bend, Kansas, and moved to live on the hospital campus. It was there she met Dorothy Harder, a, an American nurse who spoke German and befriended Mildred, encouraged her to continue her education. In August of 1947, Mildred moved to Lorraine, Kansas, to live with Carl and Esther Dobrinsky and their children to attend Lorraine High School. Dorothy, the nurse who befriended Mildred at St. Rose Hospital, was a graduate of Lorraine High School and introduced Mildred to the Dobrinskys. Esther Dobrinsky had been Mildred's, or had been Dorothy's high school English teacher. September 1947, Mildred began the ninth grade and knew very little English. She was 18 years old, four years older than her peers. By 1948, Mildred's sophomore year at 19 years old, she will begin making public appearances to share her story and became a well-known personality in her area of Kansas. Factors that helped Mildred succeed include the fact that Lorraine High School was a very small school. There were seven in her ninth grade class. Lorraine was settled by German immigrants and many others with a similar background. Lorraine High School had a dedicated faculty and staff and welcoming, friendly students who took Mildred in. On May 15, 1951, Mildred graduated from high school at age 22. And while she was in high school, the fall of 1949, Mildred met Leon Jansen and they began dating. They met at church. He was a farmer and lived in the area. He had graduated from Lorraine High School in 1945. On Christmas 1951, Mildred and Leon got engaged and on May 2nd of 1953, Mildred and Leon were married at the First Baptist Church, Lorraine, Kansas. Five months later, Mildred and Leon go to the train station in Hutchison, Kansas, meet the 1.55 p.m. train, the Santa Fe Express, and there Mildred was reunited with her mother and brother after a long seven-year separation. My parents, Leon and Mildred, have four children, Karen, Kenton, Susan, and Galen. It's great to be with you tonight. Probably the most uh, commonly asked question I get when I talk to people about Mildred's story is how did we meet? Um, and Providence is sort of the quick answer, but in 2006, I'm a retired history teacher um, and taught in the secondary and the college level. But in 2006, I had gone back to graduate school while at night and then teaching during the day, which probably many of you are doing the same thing. But I graduated in 2010, and my mother was very kind to invite me to go with her on a Sound of Music tour, 
um, to Southern Germany and to Austria to celebrate that milestone in my life. And we met the group in Vienna, Austria. And so the first night we were there in the hotel and we meet in the, the room um, with our tour guide, Ingrid. I sat next to this lovely lady that's pictured here, um, Jean Binky, who was from Lyons, Kansas. And Jean is Leon Jansen's cousin, Mildred's husband. And so we just had an immediate connection. We probably all had experiences where you meet somebody and you feel like you've known them forever. But um, I was in the classroom currently at the time. Jean was a retired history teacher. We both love working with teenagers. We both love to read. We just had a lot of common threads. And my mother and I spent a lot of time that trip with Jean and her friends. And in the 10 years after that, we kept in touch. Um, I've been writing for publication probably close to 35 years, but in those 10 years, a novel that I'd written was published and also a devotional collection. And so I had sent those to Jean and she knew I was a writer. In May of 2019, Mildred's family tried to help their mother create or make a plan to form a more substantive um, edition of her story. And then in August of 2019 is when Susan contacted me. Mildred and I first met um, on Thursday, October the 10th of 2019. And I can still remember standing on her front porch and nervous before the front door opened. And when that door opened, it was just like a dear friend I'd known all my life was there. Um, and we hadn't missed a beat since, but I met, um, spent several days, about four days in Ellsworth with Mildred and her family. Also had the privilege of meeting a lot of extended family and friends of hers, peers of hers, even from her high school years that still live in that community and recorded 11 hours of interviews that, um, that helped me um, with the research. There were many challenges that I faced when writing this memoir, five um, major ones, first of all. First, I had to learn all that I could about Mildred. Soon after Susan contacted me, she sent me copies of 25 newspaper articles that had been written about her mother between the years 1948 and 2001. And from these, I was able to glean an enormous amount of information about Mildred. Also, prior to my October visit, I had sent about a document that had about 70 questions that, that Susan was very kind to ask of her mother and scribe the answers and send the document back to me. I, of course, had my interview notes and audio transcripts of those visits. And then um, once I got home in mid-October, um, I contacted extended family members of Mildred and we did um, interviews by email. Second, I had to learn all I could about this World War II period, specifically the war's last five months and then the first two years of the post-war period. And even though, you know, I had taught American history for a number of years and taught a lot about the war, I even taught a class on Hitler at a local um, college as a, just an elective. Uh, basically, you know, how did Hitler get all these people to drink the Kool-Aid? This was still a niche of the war that I had never studied. What I did with those newspaper accounts of Mildred was I made a timeline of her life, and then I found a timeline of the war, and then where those two timelines intersected is where I began my research for actual historical events that would have had direct sort of bearing on Mildred's life. The third challenge I had was trying to find a pattern for writing the memoir, much like you were going to sew a dress or a blouse, and you needed a pattern to follow. Um, I have a wonderful friend, Ken Geyer, who is also a writer, a prolific writer, a New York Times bestselling writer who has been incredibly gracious to me, but I reached out to him. Ironically enough, when I talked to him the first time that fall of 2019, he had, in the last few years prior to that, written a World War II memoir called All the Gallant Men. I'll show you a picture, a screenshot in a minute of the cover. That would be another wonderful book for your classes that your students would enjoy. But it's the true story of Mr. Donald Stratton, who was one of the last five survivors of the sinking of the USS Arizona at Pearl Harbor. And so Ken allowed me to, we corresponded a lot by email, but we had two very long phone calls, which I took copious notes and then wrote a lot in the copy of his book. But anyway, that became my pattern. A fourth challenge, I had to learn to write in the voice of another person. 
I tried to use a conversational style of writing. I um, also studied a lot of audio recordings of Mildred and studied her voice patterns. And then also, every time I would get, say, five chapters written, I would dump them into a Word document, which I called a bundle, and then would send a bundle on to Susan, who then forwarded that email on to her sister Karen, who lives with her mother. And they would read through those and then probably within a day or two, I'd get an email from either Karen or Susan saying, you need to change this word. My mother would not have used that or, you know, the dress was blue and not gray as you described it. But that allowed us to try to really make this very authentic. And the, the third challenge we had was trying to assimilate um, and integrate the enormous amount of historical research into this book so that it, again, wouldn't sound like a textbook. Again, tried to tell it like I was telling a story. Um, writing Mildred's story um, was, again, another very um, interesting experience. Uh, the room where the lamp is and then sort of the picture under the typewriter, and that's the room in our home. It was our son Mark's bedroom. He is married with a family, as is our daughter Lauren, and lives, you know, away. But I knew that he was living out of state at the time, and so this was a quiet place I could hold away every day. And then you can see Mildred at her dining room table where she settled and, and put all her research materials um, I began writing the book on October 28th. I actually wrote the book proposal first. When you write a book proposal, you have to um, create a table of contents and also um, summaries of chapters. And so we did that. Um, it took me four and a half months to write the manuscript. I finished it on Mildred's birthday, March the 11th or 91st birthday. I spent well over 732 hours. And then we just had wonderful success with our publisher. We 16 days um, between when Susan submitted the proposal to when we were offered a contract and 21 days between date of submission and when Mildred signed the contract. Again, without Ken Geyer's support, um, we would not I don't know, I had as much success. He just helped us in so many ways. But once the book was finished, the manuscript, I reached out to Ken again and asked if he would read the manuscript and if so move, would write the foreword to the book. And he graciously agreed. But this again is the, is the cover of his book, All the Gallant Men, that would again be great. It's been a great privilege to share Mildred's story on several occasions with her, both in Kansas and Mississippi, where I live. Um, and readers old and young alike are captivated by her story. Mildred's story talks uh, very explicitly about life in a war zone. Um, you know, several factors that would tie in, I'm sure, with what you are learning, your students are learning in your, in your history textbooks, that rationing was something that the Schindler's faced, certainly with clothing and food, leather goods, shoes and soap. Also, um, bombing. Thankfully, the fact that the, that the Schindlers lived in a rural area, I, I believe, protected them in many ways. But there are many accounts of Mildred and her family hearing and or seeing Allied bombers flying overhead. Mildred and her family became part of 11 million ethnic German, uh, Germans who became refugees during the war. Also, employment history does tell us that in 1943, German women between the ages of 17 and 45 are required to register for work because, of course, most of the men were gone. We know this did not happen to Mutti, Mildred's mother. I think, I believe, again, their living in a rural area protected them. And then, of course, the Schindlers were displaced. Um, one of the important aspects of this book was what Mildred and her family had to face as refugees. And some of these things, although your students, your teenagers do not live in a time of war, they will have encountered life circumstances, um, drug addiction or divorce or some family trauma that they could identify. You know, Mildred lost the things that she enjoyed, things like leisure pursuits or regular routine. She lost her role in her life, her language. When she comes to the United States, even though she is an American by birth, German is her primary language. She lost the important people in her life, her father, and then certainly a lot of her extended family. She lost all of her physical possessions, and mainly she lost control over her life. 
um, the encouragement for your team readers that I'd love for you to take away are these key, these emotional keys to Mildred's survival. You heard in her words how she found her voice to stand up to that Russian officer. Um, I think that's very important, especially as someone who taught teenagers for a number of years. You have to help those kids learn to stand up and find their voice. I think everyone does it in their own way. Mildred also had a deep faith in God. She had seen that modeled in her parents. She will later come to appropriate that as her own, but believing that that someone was watching out for them. She also had an indomitable will and had the gift of perseverance. Mildred also had a very resilient spirit, a very flexible um, spirit. And then what I believe is her greatest um, key in her life is that Mildred made a decision early on with her heart and her spirit to choose joy. Of all the people I've ever met in my life, Mildred has every reason to be bitter and dark, and she is not. She is so joy-filled. So I just want to leave you with a quote of Mildred's. It says, do you who live in America really appreciate your freedom? You are the most blessed and fortunate people on earth. And I think for those of you that teach American history to help teach our next generation, what a precious gift our birthright is as American citizens. And now I'm going to turn this back over to Susan. Thank you, Sherry. And now I would like to introduce you to my mother, the brave and joyful survivor of this World War II odyssey, Mildred Schindler Jansen. She wants to share a few remarks about her experiences in a classroom and then she'll take questions. So I want to move over here. Oh, yeah. Thank you. You want to say something in German? Greet them in German. Guten Abend. Ich muss Deutsch sprechen. Can Sie verstehen? Can you understand? I'm trying to speak German. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here and share with you, ladies. And Sherry is one of my adopted daughters, as you know by now, because she is my daughter's age about, and I just learned to love her over three days when she was here. She made me feel so comfortable, and I was so hesitant to do this, and Sherry made me feel so comfortable, and so I just adopted her. <laughs> I'm going to share you something that touched my heart. The teacher, the Holocaust teacher in Alliance High School, which is what an hour, about an hour, an hour. about an hour from here, was reading my book to seventh grade students. And uh, Karen, my oldest daughter, found out about it and she works in Lions for a lady. And she said, Mom, I'm going to buy 25 books and take it to the school so the students can have their own copies to follow along. So she took the books there and the students were just delighted. They read the book. And on the 5th of May this year, I went to speak to the set, answer questions to the seventh graders. And having raised four seventh graders, I didn't know what to expect. I thought that half of them probably be sleeping and they wouldn't be interested. But I was so surprised. There was 30 in a classroom and they had such intelligent questions and they sat there spellbound. Of course, I did tell them that my brother was their age. He was 13 years old. And so he was their age. And so that might have been what helped. But anyway, they asked such. And then at the end of the questions, there was two classrooms, two of 30 
one classroom and then another classroom, seventh graders. And they gave me a box of blessings, which is a card. They were cards. And on the back of each card, they wrote a message. Some of them had two names on, then they signed their name. And this just touched my heart. One of the, uh, what they wrote, you gave me hope. What seventh grader hope? Think about that. And that just, I just couldn't hardly, what hope did I give them? You helped me trust again. You inspire me to be better. And there was a, some of them, there was two of them that signed the card because there was 50 cards and 60 students. And we will tell our families about you. I didn't know I could like somebody I never met. And at the end, about eight of them, mostly boys came around and we talked a little while and one of them said, I would love to give you a great big hug. And I says, and I'd like to give you a hug too. Mm -hmm. And we hugged. And that was such a great experience that I want to get into more schools. I want to talk to schools if they will read the book. Do we have any questions, Lori? Um, so what I want to say is um, anybody that has a question, if you could please put it in the chat. But I'm going to start with one. Um, and uh, we'll have time for a couple of questions. So um, feel free to put questions in the chat, please. So Mildred, my first question is, um, were you able to be in contact with your mother and brother when you were in America and they were still back in Europe um, until you got to see them again? Yes. Letters took six weeks to get over there. There was no, like, Aramil, it was six weeks. Letters. That took six weeks. Yes, I was in contact with them. I get letters from them and they, and, but it was such a lonely time because being away for so long, mm -hmm. it, I got kind of homesick, especially my freshman year when I couldn't speak much English and school was hard for me, even though I was in a small school and had a lot of help, it was still lonesome. I was still kind of lonesome for my family. Yes, it was hard, but I did have letters back and forth. Yes. Okay, awesome. Uh, we have a question that says, um, have you ever gone back to your farm in Germany? Yes, my husband took me back twice. Mm -hmm. You, Of course, it's Poland now. Mm -hmm. So my girlfriend said, where we, he, we stayed with them, and she said, don't forget your passport. Well, you have to have your passport in order to go from Germany to Poland. So we took our passport. And when I handed my passport to the Polish soldier, my heart was beating in my throat. <clears throat> and my husband, Leon, said, are you scared? And I says, yes, I'm scared. What if he doesn't give it back to me? I can't go back home. Mm -hmm. And so he walks over to a little shed and stamps it that I had been there. And then he brought it back. But in the meantime, I was afraid because what I had gone through, I didn't, I didn't trust him. Tell them what was on the farm, what you saw. On a farm, there was nothing left when we got there. A white lilac bush and an apple tree was the only thing. There were no buildings standing, nothing. Just that was all that was left. Okay. Um, another question we have is, uh, did you ever find out what happened to your father? No. The reason... We don't know because, you know, when I worked for the, in a wash camp, they lined us up. Never once did they ask our name. They did not, probably did not know who my dad was. They never once in the three weeks I was there asked my name. They just point to us. 
So how would they know where he died and when he died? Uh, my mother said, I wish he had died at home so I could have buried him because their soldiers were buried. They just scratched him under. My brother found a pair of shoes. He was so excited when we got back home. There was a couple, he saw a pair of shoes. They were kind of sticking out of the ground. Well, there was a body in it. And he didn't take the shoes. That that he needed the shoes, but he wasn't going to take them off of the soldier. So that's probably how my dad got buried. And that's the sad part. Mm -hmm. Um how how did your mother and brother finally get to the United States? What how was there a process? Was you know, how did they manage to get there? Yes. Uh, after the wall went down, it finally was easier to get. And then they had help from, my mother had to do a lot of paperwork and I had to make sure that the money, I sent the money. I was working at the bank in Lorraine. I worked there for 30 years, but I, at the time I was working and they wanted to make sure that the money was there for them to come over. So that's, when I, after I sent the money, then that seemed to satisfy him. And then they finally, finally, we waited to get married for about a year. Mm -hmm. And we were hoping they'd get here when we got married. And we finally got married. Um, and then they came six months later. They finally got out. So that was a happy time. And my husband could not speak German and they couldn't speak English, but we got along fine. <clears throat> so uh, I noticed in your story that you started speaking about your experiences very early in your life. Um, what prompted that first time? Did somebody ask you to tell your story? Did you tell it in school? Yes, I told it in school. I belong to Kayette organization a girls organization in school and they different schools around would ask if I come and speak to them. Mm -hmm. The first time I went, the lady that the people that I stayed with her dad was a pastor in one of the churches about an hour away from where we lived. And we went there and I spoke in that church. I, I tried to speak but she had to help me. I just, I had a really hard time. It was hard then. I had to kind of start, I think maybe my sophomore year or junior year was easier. I remember going to Wichita and I, and I was a junior and I was to speak to, was it the Chamber of Commerce, this all man? And there was 200 men. Mm -hmm. And I'm up on this platform, and I thought I was going to faint. I looked down, and all these men, and here I am telling my story. I got along just fine, and I have a letter in my book that was written to the man that organized that that's the best presentation he's they've ever had. In a, so I must have... It must have went all right, but I sure was scared. <laughs> did you ever speak in your daughter's schools or your, your son's schools, did your ch own children's schools when they were growing up? Did you go speak in their schools at all? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yes. And grandchildren. Oh, yeah, and grandchildren. Yes. Yes, I did. How many grandchildren do you have? I have six grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. And I'm still enjoying life. I go to exercise twice a week and I'm still enjoying life. I One feel like I'm a happy person. I'm I'm not this is how my mother was and I she took good care of me and I just feel like I've had a good life since I've been here. Well, if there are any um, final words you want to share with the teachers, um, about maybe what um, what message you think um, you most would like for them to share about your story or just anything you want to say to the teachers to end? Yes, <clears throat> I wish they would teach 
do you still teach history in schools? Do you still teach history? If you do, this, this was real. This is not made up. This actually happened. And I was so impressed with those seventh graders that I want to get into more schools. And if they will read the book, we will donate some books around here, you know, to the schools that they can share the books with the teachers. <clears throat> and tell them that there's an educational discount on the education edition. Oh, the educational. Well, you know more about that than I do about <laughs> the educational. Well, actually, yes, we're going to, um, we're going to kind of end with that. We have um, some resources we'll be sharing with the teacher. Um, Susan and Sherry, when does that educational edition come out? We hope maybe within the next three weeks. Okay. Um, but you guys are going to also get the kind of the preview, I guess, of some of the educational materials that are coming out in the educational edition. We're going to let you know when it comes out. We'll send you a follow-up email. Um, because they've developed some materials just for teachers to be able to use in the classroom um, with some discussion questions and a number of other things. And um, I think you will find that it's uh, a great resource for you to use uh, in, in teaching in your classrooms. So we're going to share that with you, but we're also going to share um, different places you can order the book and get discounts. Um, so they've graciously shared so many things with us and we just want to say thank you for, um, being willing to be, speak with us tonight, Mildred and Susan and Sherry, um, and give us this different perspective that frankly, I didn't know as much about before I started reading Mildred's story. And, um, I think that is an important part of this, uh, time in history that we need to be aware of. Um, so we want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we'll send a follow-up email with all the links, including an evaluation link of the webinar for those teachers who would like to receive uh, continuing education credits um, at, the, uh, at the end here. So if you fill that out, then um, in, at the end of each semester, we send you um, a certificate with any of our webinars that you have attended um, and kind of do it all at once because we have another webinar coming up at the end of November and yet another one in January, and you can look on our website and see all of those. Um, but I just want to thank everybody tonight. It's uh, 8.02, so we want to wrap it up, and, um, and, and thank you yet again. Um, we appreciate you all, and uh, Sherry, Susan, is there anything else you guys would like to say? Thank you for this opportunity. Yes, yes. thank, thank you, you for having us. <laughs> thank you very much, ladies. <clears throat> everybody, we wish you a good night. Um, and a good day at school tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.